thank you very much, Seamus, and it's a pleasure to join you all this morning. And I suppose, first off, I, I do want to commend each of you for being part of this programme and setting an example um, regarding how we're going to meet the challenges ahead for agriculture. And I suppose this presentation is going to try and hopefully uh, give you some uh, tips that you can use around your farm and talk about the uh, fit of protected urea. And really, protected urea is a way to get nitrogen on your farm, um, but it's, it's not the only way. Also, you can grow some of your own nitrogen using clover. So we'll touch on that too. First off, what's protected urea? For some of you, you may be very familiar with it and are already using it, and for others, perhaps not so much. Uh, well, protected urea, it's standard urea as a base, and added to it, it has something called a urease inhibitor. That urease inhibitor mimics urea and blocks the urease enzyme, and in so doing, can reduce losses of ammonia. And just like slurry, as William was talking to you about, urea also loses some of its nitrogen as ammonia. And that's nitrogen that you paid for. And particularly in the coming year, that cost is very high. Also, that ammonia that's lost from urea counts towards our national emissions of ammonia. And we have a challenge there to meet our ammonia loss ceiling. EPA estimate that on average, urea loses about 15.5% of its uh, nitrogen as ammonia. So if you hang on to that nitrogen, you can have it on your farm to grow grass. And that's more valuable than ever in the coming year. Protected urea takes the loss down to around about the 3% level. And that means that simply by adding the urease inhibitor to urea, you've got more effective nitrogen delivered to the plant, which the plant can use. And it also opens up the possibility to cut your rate of protected urea by around 12% versus your standard urea rate. So I suppose the tip from this is protected urea. You can think about it like low emission spreading for urea, but you don't need all the equipment and it has very high efficacy. So it's a very effective add-on to urea to stop that loss. So you might say, I thought we were doing this because of greenhouse gases. Well, we are, and I suppose we have multiple challenges there. And is there a greenhouse gas saving? So on the one side of the picture here, you can see a tractor spreading fertilizer, and the other side, animals. And on the greenhouse grass picture, we have that challenge there to reduce methane emissions from the animals, and work is undergoing to get the technologies in place uh, for us to do that. But on the fertilizer side, comparing to using calcium ammonium nitrate, we have seen in the research that we can cut the emission factor or the loss of nitrogen as nitrous oxide by 73% versus loss from, from CAN. Now these are small amounts of nitrogen in the overall scheme of things that are lost as nitrous oxide, but that type of saving, because nitrous oxide is so potent, really counts very strongly in the national inventory of emissions. So on your farm, protected urea, a change of fertilizer form and clover, whereby you have less reliance on imported fertilizer nitrogen, are solutions that can be taken up right now. And I, for me, these two go very much hand in hand. So where does protected urea fit on your farm? In the signpost program, there's a range of different farmers, okay? So there's, I suppose, the animal-based farmers, um, including dairy farmers, which typically have more straight nitrogen slots in their fertilizer program, and also suckler, beef, and sheep farmers who may have less straight nitrogen slots, and maybe you're using some compound. So the fit here is substituting straight urea and straight can with protected urea. There's also some arable farmers in the program, and you might be wondering, how does this fit for me? Well, in the research, we didn't see a big difference between the emissions of nitrous oxide between protected urea and CAN. So if you're already using CAN, you can continue to do that. However, if you are using urea, you can substitute it for protected urea, thus saving ammonia loss. And actually with the cost of fertilizer now, that makes a lot of economic sense to do that. You also have colleges, and you can refer to the guidance above, depending on what land age area you're managing. Pig farmers, you may also have a land area, refer to guidance above, 
And also just to emphasize that you have a very valuable fertilizer and it's very important to spread that with the low emission spreading um, because it's got a greater portion of available nitrogen, which is also available to loss. Um, and you can hang on to that using the low emission spreading. And we've got organic farmers. And organic farmers are already growing your own nitrogen, if you like, using legumes. And there's lessons that we can take there that I think can be incorporated into most farms. So while we're mentioning growing your own nitrogen, which reduces your need for fertilizer and nitrogen overall, which is something we also need to, to do to meet the, the targets that have been set out. And what I'm showing here is uh, data from a replicated blocked experiment at Johnstown Castle, where there's pH in, in um, four increments going from 5.4 all the way up to 6.9. And, and, and this um, grass ward was overseeded with clover, and you can see here the steps of the stairs increase in yield in that grass clover's ward as you march on up in pH. An extra two and a half tons of dry matter produced there at 6.9 versus 5.4 pH. So I suppose that goes to emphasize the point that David was making earlier about the value of lime. And that's even more so the case where you're trying to get clover going. You might say there's a lot of management with, with clover, but look at current nitrogen prices, you're going to be very well paid for that. If you compare back by 75 kilograms N per hectare on a 50 hectare farm, that's almost 10 grand in your pocket. And I suppose, you know, James Humphreys has shown it's hollow head that he can get back to zero. So now maybe that's a, a journey to go for, for many of us, but um, just by coming back by 75 kilograms, that's the level of money you're, you're talking. So my tip is, if you've got existing clover on the farm, which many of you may, that may not have been paid a huge amount of attention to, you can give it a boost by liming when you get the chance to do so. And that's a measure that you can take to save yourself um, some fertilizer nitrogen in the coming year. And if you're establishing clover, you need to lift the pH first. That's the first step. You're going nowhere if you don't do that first. Now, back to protected urea. I suppose the question has often come in, like, is there a yield advantage to it over urea? The short-term cutting and grazing trials didn't see a difference between the fertilizers. So what I've done here is present data from a long-term trial at Johnson Castle, where the same fertilizers are applied to the same plots continually, and this is a seven-year uh, data set. Now, just to focus on the fertilizer effect, the blue line across at 100 is urea. That's the yield of, of urea set at 100%. For those of you familiar with variety trials, that's relative yield. Everything else expressed relative to the urea yield. The red line at the bottom is what the zero nitrogen control uh, grew in the background, anything from 30 to 40% of the urea yield. Um, the, the purple dots, let's take a look at the can. Can was above the urea line um, in terms of its yield performance in five out of seven of those years. And protected urea, was above the urea line in six out of seven years. So let's just kind of summarize what this looks like in terms of what was the yield advantage for protected urea and can indeed over urea um, based on the grass that they grew, which is the difference between what the background grew and what the fertilizer grew. So if we exclude 2018, which was a drought year and nitrogen wasn't the limiter here, it was water, um, the can grew an extra 9% of grass over, um, over urea, and the protected urea grew an extra 13% on average more than urea. So over the long term, protected urea, it does grow more grass, and I suppose that extra yield is, percentage-wise, is very close to that additional effective nitrogen or effective nitrogen delivered to the plant that I spoke about earlier. Another tip is don't forget about sulfur. This is work from uh, Claire Aspel, who's lo been looking at response to sulfur on a number of soils. And we see here, moving from the left to the right of the graph, um, from very fine textured soils to very sandy loam uh, textured soils, about an extra ton of yield um, produced um, there for, I suppose, four out of five of the soils. And the sandy loam soil actually giving a, a three ton boost in these particular soils. Um, so sulfur, you know, it can be important, uh, particularly if you've got those sandier textured soils. And don't forget about sulfur when you're 
applying your silage fertilizer. Um, don't rely on the sulfur from the slurry. Claire saw only about 9% of the sulfur in the slurry was available to the plant. And also clover needs sulfur. So as we pair back on nitrogen, don't forget about sulfur. And you have options there, which are say sulfacan, which might deliver six kilograms for a 30 kilogram N application, but also ammonium sulfate nitrate or ASN and ammonium sulfate. And also, I suppose on the environmental side, Claire was seeing reduced nitrogen leaching with use of sulfur on a sandy soil. So you might be asking, which products should I use? You know, it's a bit confusing. Well, on our soil fertility website, we keep an up-to-date list of products. Last year, there was 20 products, six companies, and there's options there, straight nitrogen and nitrogen plus sulfur, also an N plus K plus S option, but no option containing P, as you might note. So if you need to use P, use your standard compounds. Um, you know, the supply question comes up, you know, the way to get around that is to order in advance and start asking, asking early for it. Just to finish up on, I suppose, the question of, of soil health is, is one that's raised. Because we have this long-term trial in Johnstone Castle, we've been able to look at uh, the bacterial and fungal populations as affected by fertilizer. And in summary, there was no significant difference in bacterial or fungal populations um, based on the fertilizers that were applied. And look at the scale. We're talking tens of millions of bacteria per grams of soil and tens of thousands of fungi per uh, gram of soil. And I want to credit Aoife Duff and Fiona Brennan for the great work that they've done on, I suppose, understanding those communities. Also, um, the diversity of the communities there, or the who is who, is quite similar between the different fertilizers. So just to conclude, the fit for protected urea on grassland farms is substituting it for can and urea. On the arable cropping, if you're using urea, substitute it here. You can keep going with your can if, you're, if that's what you're doing, but you can use protected urea also if you want to. Because protected urea delivers more effective nitrogen that the grass can use versus standard urea, there's potential there to pull back your rate by around 12%. Um, that was very similar to the additional yield that we saw in the long-term trial of about 13%. Don't forget sulfur. If in doubt around products, consult the online list. And you can't emphasize enough the point that David made around lime, and that's even more important when you're trying to get clover into swords. So thank you for your attention. I'll